Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a bit after seven o'clock, so we're late already. That's just the way the world works, isn't it? So, uh, um, an enormous welcome to you all uh, to this very special venue, because it, just think to yourselves, although you came in through the next door, Steele's premises, you are actually on old Chisnell premises here, because we're on top of where the original garage was. River out there, petrol station that way. And uh, this was uh, First World War barn or, well, no, what do you put aircraft in? Hangar. That's it. And uh, um, uh, so I'm getting old, don't know the words anymore. But uh, anyway, uh, so we're right bang, slap bang in the middle of the King Alfred story sitting here. And so uh, this had to be the venue for this evening's celebration. For Because although when I looked at that over there and I thought, what that big table for over there? And I, it occurred to me what also happens in this building. <laughs> Tonight, we are very much talking about celebration of something very much alive, which is, although it isn't, curiously, it's a strange thing, this, isn't it? The whole thing about King Alfred buses is that they finished in 1973, which is 49 years ago. But here we are, and nobody would have believed this in 1973, uh, uh, celebrating it with a whole line of King Alfred buses outside somewhere, um, though they aren't these days, of course, just round the corner in the, in the shed in Hillside Garage, just the other side of the road. They are a bit further away now. But nonetheless, here we are, able to mark 100 years on Sunday uh, since the very first uh, bus service, King Alfred bus service, started in the city, uh, running to Stanmore, Twyford, Littleton, uh, and it did so, as it says in your brochure, I hope you've noticed that on your seat, you may have been sitting on it, wondering why it was so uncomfortable. Uh, this has been produced as a, a commemoration uh, to take away, a souvenir. Uh, it's been done for us by Ray Stanning, who does our uh, running day programmes. It's rather nice, I think, a, a thing to, to remember uh, what we're doing. But it does have the, the initial roots in it and everything else about uh, what we're going to do on Sunday. So remember that we're all invited you're all invited, we're all invited, everybody's invited to join uh, three buses on Sunday, 10 o'clock from the Broadway. We're going to retrace the routes of the uh, King Alfred buses. Let's get started then. This divides into three bits. Firm, as it was, King Alfred Motor Services, which of course was R. Chisnell and Sons Limited. So a municipal bus operation run by a private company. That was a very, very unusual, in UK terms, probably unique arrangement. And uh, that went on until 1973. Then there was a bit of a hiatus. And then in 1985, the Friends of King Alfred Buses came about. And uh, 
we, we share a few stories about that. And then we need to think about what we're going to do. Where are we going to park these things in the long term? So right back then to the beginning, folks. You are uh, cast your minds back to the First World War. Um, a, a tremendous carnage and whatever. But in Winchester, what was happening was that enormous army camps were being built on the on Morn Hill, on the uh, sort of east side of the city. And getting those people in and out of the town was a, a requirement. And Mr. Chisnell, whose premises were right here on the corner, just outside, hit on the idea of providing a, effectively a, a transit service for, mainly for the officers, I have to say. And these are three Delaunay Belleville shooting brakes, which he bought for the purposes. There was a fourth one, a Napier. And they trundled up and down Morn Hill. And to begin with, they took the money at the end of the ride. And then they found that everyone got off before they got there. So they took the money before. And, and across the road, they had a sausages, potatoes, and onions shop, which uh, did brilliant business during the operation. So anyway, that's those. Here they are lined up. This is a bit after the war because that started Mr. Chisnell in uh, Mr. The, uh, Mr. Robert Chisnell, um, who conveniently named one of his sons Robert, who then named one of his sons Robert. So that really confuses the friends of King Alfred Buses because we've got Roberts all over the place. But sadly not Robert, uh, young Robert, as we're inclined to call him, who is probably a tad over 80 somewhere, but uh, who was hoping to come tonight, but unfortunately wasn't able to. So he's, uh, as it were, uh, Mr. Bob's son, where Richard here is Mr. Fred's son, so uh, pity that he's not here. But he is in here with, in, in spirit, I think he, he said to me. Okay, in 1920, they took uh, Sharabang off to Cheddar, and they were so keen to get going, it was Whit Sunday, that they actually didn't have a license for that vehicle, so they stuck it, well, they just kept going with its trade plates on it, and off they went. Imagine a uh, solid, tired, open-top vehicle going at 12 miles an hour max, going to Cheddar from here and back in the course of a day. Must have been quite an exercise, wasn't it? So there they all standing around to, to see to it. Remember, Mr. Chisnell was uh, born in 1870, so that by 1920 he was 50. So he was no chicken even then, and all the development years of King Alfred were in his 50s and 60s. Interesting. Um, this is just a, a bit of promotion that they were given. Here's the gas company outing. It is said Mr. Tremlett, who was the first engineer, who retired in 1957, when uh, Robert Jowett sadly lost to us. Uh, he died in uh, January of this year. But Robert and I worked with the Chisnell family and many other people to, to research the history. And Mr. Tremlett used to come along in his carpet slippers. He'd retired in 1957. This was in 1984. So he was well into his 90s, and he would describe how uh, this particular outing, because he looked at this picture and he said, ah, all those gentlemen, he said they were, we were driving along and they wanted to relieve themselves. So they did, over the side. <laughs> anyway, there we are. Here they are in the Broadway. Now, in the middle of the Sharabangs, they found they had a coach called the Saloon. In this picture, it's the middle one. You can see it's got a roof on it. And they hit on the idea of the saloon could be the bus. And that's the vehicle that set off in 1922 on the 9th of October to go on the first bus operation. It was run by a crew of two, uh, a driver and conductor. Bill Isles was the conductor on the first, the morning shift. And he was still talking to us in the mid-1980s about his experiences. He'd worked with the company right the way through till 1973. And um, that was how it all began. So with the saloon, it was quite a bulbous thing, looking at the back of it. And uh, it, it uh, ran on its own for a year. They ran it six days a week, and it rested on the seventh. And then uh, after a year, they had a second bus, B bus, as they called it. And then the buses started coming thick and fast. This is an Albion. Uh, you can recognize where that is in the Broadway, can't you? The trees are a bit smaller then, but a similar idea. There were other old coaches, uh, beautiful Dennis's, and if you look at all the army officers in this picture, you'll see the sort of thing. They were beginning to become a bit of a fixture and fitting in, in Winchester, quite quickly, in fact. Remember that how this has all started is that the city council had actually approached Mr. Chisnell and said, would you like to run a bus service in our city? And uh, he'd uh, uh, gone around to have a look with the bus and broken a curbstone, and that was the first of many disputes between the city council and <laughs> Uh, King Alfred Motor Services, but um, suffice it to say that nobody ever paid for the, per for the curb stone. So this picture, uh, which shows the view, of course, where we know where this is uh, down. But if you look closely down at the bottom left of this picture, as you look at it, you'll see that they're building the hillside garage. 
Um, and uh, this is the start of the expansion of the space because what uh, uh, this next door place here was good enough but it was nowhere near big enough for the sort of operation that was starting to develop and in fact uh, the hillside garage was evolved over a series of developments right through to the 1960s and uh, uh, is a sadly missed piece of equipment that we could do use that would be a wonderful place for us but um, it's gone so we can't anyway there we are um, firm moved out into um, horse boxes, and, which is what these are, and also hearses, of course. And it is said that they fell out with the steels because the steels got their own hearses, and that was all rather difficult. But anyway, they were next door neighbors then as now, or not quite now, but anyway, there we are. But of course, the horse boxes are important because Mr. Chisnell was a great man for the horses. And it is said that he had to carry his, his bride over the threshold on the day of their marriage uh, uh, as it were, uh, uh, by hand, because he'd um, not done so well on the horses that day. But I don't know whether that's true or not. <laughs> but uh, uh, um, it was uh, something we talked about a lot. Here is some King Alfred staff looking uh, uh, very dapper. And uh, this is the uh, little Dennis, just like the one you saw outside, only this is the other one. This is 9285, we've got 9286. See the elaborate painting here. Now, um, one of our members I died last year and left us a, um, a sizable sum of money which we're going to use to paint the Dennis that we have in this rather fine style. So it'll look rather splendid when it's done. Other buses, this is the last bus that was bought before the war. Um, until the war, all the buses in Winchester were single deck, all the King Alfred buses. And uh, this one actually was delivered in 1940. Uh, it's an Albion. Then... Winchester, of course, was a place where people, it was a safe place. So lots of people were sent to this part of the world. The problem was that the bus coming from Overton, for example, would be several buses, three or four buses in a line, and the conductor would jump from one to the next to the next to the next. So uh, Chisnell was able to uh, make the case for double-deck buses, and he did. And this is the first one to be delivered. This is a 1942 uh, Leyland. It was the very first double-decker in Winchester, and it ran for, for nearly uh, 20 years in the city. And then they had some others, and this is um, a guy. Look how dull it is, uh, and how grey it all looks. Very, so this is immediately after the war. There's a little white mark on the front wing to show um, that you, you know, in the, in the blackout you could look at it. This picture came from a lady in uh, a Walpole Road in Stanmore. Um, this is taken immediately after the war in the Broadway, and there's the Dennis. It is in fact our Dennis that's sitting there. Um, we're sitting outside here this evening. That's an incredible jump across the generations, isn't it? Then, the, the, just to prove the sort of thing that happens to us in Friends of King Alfred buses, uh, this picture appeared this year, came from the bus archive. We don't know where it is, but it's a King Alfred bus. And we've looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked at it, and we still can't work out where it is. It's somewhere in our network, and uh, uh, it remains a complete conundrum. So, but there it is, and that's the other one the other Dennis, and that was sold in 1943. So we know that's a, a wartime picture. And here is a picture taken in 1945. The lady here is a girl called Janet White. She joined the conducting staff in 1943. The conductresses started in 1942 in King Alfred as part of the war effort. It is said that there were a number of others. A famous one was a girl called Blondie. Blondie was a very well-known conductor who worked for many years for the company. It is said that uh, at one point, Mr. Fred Chisnell, who is, of course, uh, father to uh, two people in this room, was uh, driving one of their large cars to somewhere, and he had two conductresses with him. And he is reported to have said that he was as cool as a cucumber at the time, which I always think is rather an interesting story, isn't it? Here's another King Alfred conductress with her wartime Bedford bus alongside. And another place we don't know where it is at all, haven't got a clue, but it must be somewhere in the Winchester area, so there's a clue. Now, we do know where this is, because this is after the war, things are beginning to get straight, and this is the beginning of buying a lot of Leyland double-deck buses. This is in Littleton. This bus is going to Nether Wallop, amazingly. They did that until about 1955. And here's the bus again with Bert Matwick and... Sid Kemish. And Sid Kemish was the conductor of this bus. They were based in Stockbridge. And in 1963, in the Great Freeze, do you remember it? Well, some of you will, that this bus, or, or in fact it's a different one, 594, was coming back over from Crawley into Winchester, and at Long Park it got stuck in the snowdrifts, and there it remained for five days. The crew had to walk into civilization, and one of the women on the bus was in fact going to have her baby at the hospital. Sid Kemish had to carry her 
across the snowdrifts all the way to the county hospital. Imagine that. Amazing, isn't it? A couple of days later, young Robert, who might have been with us tonight but isn't, uh, went out over the drifts and took a whole lot of pictures. Unfortunately, I haven't included one in here, but there you are. So there were, there were 13 of these Leyland Titans, some of them low, some of them high. Um, and there were some single deck Leylands as well. This one's up in, uh, at the Fox Lane stop, actually, in Minden Way, which uh, on the 4A, is that, it looks a bit barer than it does now. Amazing, new Stanmore. This is, in fact, 1953, not the uh, story I was telling you about, but this is Westley Lane in Sparsholt, and this bus spent quite a while out there as well. It's still a bit like that now, actually. It's rather a narrow road, Westley Lane, at the best of times. Anyway, 1949, 50, Innovators, the Chisnells, uh, they bought Hampshire's first underfloor engine bus, a Leyland Olympic. Here it is, 708, and of course, we own it. Uh, they had some other coaches. These are actually in my hometown in Bath, but that's beside the point. More modern ones, that's at Wembley Stadium, and uh, single-deck buses. So that's Mar, was it five or four? Five. And Cromwell Road for uh, Rodney here, uh, number three. Here we are in Whitchurch. Look, in 1960, they needed two double-deckers to bring the people in from Whitchurch at 11 o'clock in the morning. Astonishing, isn't it? Nowadays, you wouldn't see that. This is an a, a AEC bus going to Week, and uh, then they bought these long leopards that look like this, and always modern and, and exciting. These are AEC uh, outside the petrol station, just outside here, in fact, if you look. Here's a coach. I put this in for Nigel's benefit because I think it's in some Dorset village somewhere. Uh, this is a coach. Again, we have this coach. And here is a double-decker bus climbing up past uh, Magdalen Hill. Well, we don't have that one anymore, but we did have it. We've got two others just like it. And here's a picture taken in 1969 in Fisher's Pond. Well, that's, actually, this is at Shawford Station. This is the bridge. And one of these people in this picture, the young lady in the middle, is none other than Mary Curry. There she is. And she's uh, carrying a, a, a bunch of flowers. And this is the beginning of the end, really, because this was the last trip to Fisher's Pond, the number two service, 25 past six uh, in March 1969. And the locals had uh, stopped the bus and produced a presentation for uh, Steve Cleary and uh, Mary Taylor, as you were there, and then where I went to you. Yes, so that's, uh, that's a picture worth having, isn't it, really? I think it is, anyway. Um, as time went on, this is old and new here. We're going to have, be able to replicate that picture next year. And then the amazing thing that happened was in 1971, our Chisel & Sons Limited bought three brand new Swedish Metro Scania buses. They were an absolutely extraordinary thing and marvellous. I met a chap called Dave Scheuer, and the one person who isn't here today, who we wish was, is Dave Scheuer. He was a an amazing bus conductor from 1965 on and a great member of um, supporter of Focab, so much missed. Anyway, um, I, I started, uh, uh, my involvement was uh, first with the King Alfred bus, was 31st of March 73. I've hired this bus for nine pounds. John Sincock drove it, and that's my, my niece who's in the push chairs 51 now, so that's that. <laughs> last night, last night at the proms, um, here we have Les Hay. Uh, 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 beside the last bus, and this is Richard Chisnell giving out, well, waving the last ticket, in fact, uh, um, behind the last bus, 11 o'clock at night on the 28th of April, 73. That's the history, uh, and now...
that's the history. Uh, and now there was a bit of um, muddling along when Hanson Dorset took over. This is a King Alfred bus in the bus station. Um, I hired it for a trip in 1975. That's Mr. John Sincock there, Andrew's father, looking very, um, uh, as he always did, very smart. The Metro Scanners that we all love so much went off to a place called Stevenage, to eventually to rot away. The green buses became red, and the last red one we hired that. And here you have a little group which includes Mr. Bob and Mr. Fred, Mr. Sincock, and uh, Roy De Niro there, another King Alfred driver, and long-time supporter of Vocab now, sadly supporting the buses in the sky. And here, this is um, a, another tour. We, we, John Sinkock rang me up when I was working in Swansea and said, you've got to do something. The last King Alfred bus is being withdrawn by Hanson Dorset. So we organised a tour. And the, the chap who is second from the right is Bill Isles. He is the man who conducted the first bus to Stanmore in March 1922. So there he is in all his glory. And there's Mr. Fred and Mr. Bob and Mr. Sinkock again. And Les Hay was the driver. So that's that. Oh, we don't want to look at that. Now, <laughs> 1981. <laughs> 1981, we, we came across, uh, at least I came across, uh, in my travels in South Wales where I worked, this bus. This is one, 104. This was our first bus. It will be in the lineup on Sunday. Uh, this is uh, 41 years ago. It had um, oil in the water and water in the oil, and you could only select third and fourth gears, but it was for sale, Mr. Freeman, for £600. So I bought it. And uh, um, here it is coming back across the Seven Bridge, Robert Jarrett leaning out of the car to take a picture of it, a bit fuzzy wuzzy, but you've got the idea of the Seven Bridge at least. And uh, this is what it looks like these days. Um, this, by the way, is outside my auntie's house in Stockbridge Road, very important place. But uh, So 104 is uh, a, a Leyland single-decker from 1959, it was the first vehicle to be uh, rescued. No, it wasn't actually, because the Albion Victor was, but, and in fact the Dennis was, but we didn't know about them at the time. The second bus uh, that uh, we came across was this one. Remember the picture of the cathedral in the background? Well, that vehicle is in the left of this picture up here, that red thing. Um, by this time, it had no engine, and it, was, uh, it had lying on... Uh, when I first saw it, it was lying on its side. So it was only 50 quid. That wasn't bad value, was it, really? Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, um, it was one of the reasons why, in the end, it rotted away, I think. Anyway, it looked like that by the time we'd finished with it. This is at Netley in 1984. Um, then somebody came across this. This is a coach, as you can see. It belonged to the Totten Majorettes. Somebody said, um, we collect these sort of things, don't we? Um, yeah, better buy it then. And now we've got that one, 326. Then somebody found another one, a, another Tiger Cub, just like 104. This is 103, in fact. The number plate's on the, on the table at the back of the room. Uh, unfortunately, it got stolen in between. It had been turned into a horse box. It was full of manure. But um, some, some gypsies found it and they nicked it just before we'd managed to swap it for another coach that we bought to give to the man to be a horse box. We had to go chasing around, eventually found it in a gypsy caravan site at the end of the M10, and the police said, you can go in there if you like, but we're not. <laughs> anyway, we went in and bought it back from them for 120 quid, but not before they'd stripped out the inside, so it was a bit rough when we got it. And here it is in the scrapyard. Well, we, this is vocab members pulling the gearbox out of it as we pulled it apart because we decided the best thing to do with it was use the bits, which we've been using ever since, in fairness. This bus is in the United States. It's uh, 494. We own this. Um, this one rang me up. Well, the bus didn't, but the owner did, and said, what does the number POU494 mean to you? Uh, it's a King Alfred bus. He said, no, it's outside my window. To say that on the way back from going over to see it, I uh, came across this one. The one on the left is 596 LCG, a 1964 AEC bus that would have sit, sat over the road here. Uh, would you buy that bus? Has one wheel. Yeah, we bought it. Um, and furthermore, we had it transported from Washington DC to UK and fixed it. Here it is coming into the yard at Flexford and Charles Ford. Here it is after we'd got the man who'd rung me up the, with the London bus and we got him and his wife and his daughter and they're in that picture. And we said, these are our King Alfred buses. And th at that point, five years after he first rang me, he said, okay, you can have our bus, which he hadn't previously allowed but you've got to give us another one in exchange. So we had to drive a bus over to America and then bring up this other one back, which, as you can see, this was the condition of it. Doesn't it look good? Would you buy this? This is what it looks like now. So uh, uh, fantastic. Then somebody came along with some open toppers. Um, we needed to remember the bus on the left here is the one that looked rather groggy in that red picture you saw. 
So we decided to do away with it and put the roof onto the yellow one on the left hand side of the picture. So what we did was park them next to each other and lift them across one little bit at a time until we, the roof was no longer on the old bus, but instead, as you can see on the left, on the, on, on the, on the new one. And the new one, there's me cleaning the window and Keith Andrews holding the ladder. Only this last couple of months. That's amazing, isn't it? Then we got one of these buses and then we had another one, Leyland Panthers, they're called. If you want to spend money, roofs of Leyland Panthers is where to spend it, okay? You're looking at, by the time we finished, that bus has had 40, 50,000 quid spent on its body. Uh, yes, only had a design life of 10 years and we've been keeping it since 1970. This is what it looks like in Minden Way, very close to that picture you saw earlier on in the day. And then there was this bus, which is the uh, Dennis, the little Dennis which belonged to Vernon's Pools, curiously. It had survived because it had been worked for a school in Titchfield, which is where young Robert had been at school, and uh, so it was their school bus. And then it got lost, and eventually it appeared, fast forward, in all creatures great and small. First time round, yeah, 1975, and Winchester people went mad. King Humphrey bus, whoa! Anyway, eventually they wanted to sell it up there in Merseyside, and they wanted uh, 28,000 quid for it, uh, well, they wanted to sell it at auction, but fortunately it failed to sell. Eventually we persuaded them that we would uh, buy it for 14 grand, which was an enormous amount of money which you had to raise. And uh, uh, the, the chaps in Aintree said, well, we'll have 14,000 quid and it's going to be all in fivers in a suitcase. And we took it all in fivers. We wouldn't be able to, that to do that now, but we took all those fivers in a suitcase and the man counted them all out. Here it is in the, uh, as it was uh, uh, with Vernon's Pools up there. And then uh, um, all along we had Dave Hurley, one of our members, who wasn't a member before he was a member, but he was one afterwards. He bought this, this, this bus here. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not logic, I don't know what is. And uh, in 1963 he bought this bus, it's an Albion Victor. It had been the Chisnell's means of travelling to the races in the 1930s. And it had been rather small and rather luxurious and not much use after the war. So it had sat downstairs in the coach garage just up the road from here uh, which is still there and the basement is still there until about 1959 when it was sold to some people who were looking for a coach and uh, then Dave Hurley bought it and he had it for 50 years eventually sold it to us and this is it arriving in 2016 at our place down the road and this is it driving around the roundabout at Chilbolton Avenue with young, uh, uh, young, young, young George here driving it only a couple of months ago so there you are and then, then there's this bus the chap who wandered up to me in the Broadway at the end of one of our running days and said, I know where the Olympic is. You remember we talked about the Olympic, the first underfloor bus, engine bus? It's in Ireland. So this chap down here, um, he, uh, his name was Tony Ledbetter. He managed to get us to see this bus. It doesn't look so bad in this picture, but can I tell you it was um, utterly rotten. It was covered with lichen and it was standing with a tree next to it in a place that they called the showroom, which was a load of old junk old buses. And the chap who owned it disappeared. He knew we'd come from England and we had to go back on the ferry that night. He vanished until the absolute last second before we left and he reappeared and said, it's a thousand pound in sterling or nothing. So we gave him a thousand pound in sterling, so that was easy. There it is more recently. Uh, and then we had this thing, this appeared as, a, as a, um, a racing car transporter by the time we came along. And one of our members, Jim O'Hara, he decided that this was worth turning this back into a coach because Nigel Sandy would like to see it. This is a rather tragic but, uh, but also rather a nice story. Um, his wife, Val, bearing in mind this coach is called a Bedford Val, V-A-L, was very keen on this and then she got cancer and died. And in, in her dying phase she said to, to Jim, you're going to fix that coach, get on with it. So, and she wore the trousers in their relationship, so he did. And basically he drove the project to get that to a running vehicle which involves swapping bodies from one to another, which as you know, we're rather good at, you can see. So uh, this wasn't difficult and um, this vehicle runs today. Well, it doesn't today because it's got a new spring. And by the way, we need to raise 10,000 quid to pay for the new springs for 704, but that's beside the point. Then there was a little bus, it looks like this. It's a little Bedford minibus and these chaps are busy fixing it. Some of them are in the room today. Uh, this is uh, our friend Jack painting it. And this is what's going to come. Because this picture was taken 10 years ago by Ruth, who's in the audience. This is a over a fence and over a shed. And then you can see what's coming up the road is a double-decker, yes? And it's our last great project, for the moment anyway, which is a 1950 Leyland double-deck hybrid, 56 seat, classic design, which we are gradually, well, turning into a fine restoration, which will be coming out next year, I think, with a bit of luck and a fair wind. 
if the man that's doing the seats ever remembers to finish them. That's rather exciting. So this is an organisation which has come from one little bus, maybe two if you like, in 1985, through to we now have 15 representing from 1931 to 1970. That's not a bad deal, is it? Now, um, and that's what they look like when they're all lined up in the rain. And then we like running them. We have running days and that's a typical running day. And, but we like best when they're full of people. That's the great thing about buses is you can share them. And that's one of the nicest things about the Friends of King Henry buses. We, we not only enjoy what we're doing, which we do a lot, but we also enjoy sharing it with loads and loads and loads of people. And on our biggest running days, we've had seven, 8,000 people in a day. So it's quite amazing. Isn't it? Now. Now, we've almost finished, you'll be so relieved to know. The, the thing is this, one problem that we've never cracked is what to do with these buses. I remember when I first started in this game, a chap I rang out said, oh, you wouldn't buy the bus until you've got a place to put it. Now, on that basis, we'd have no buses, but we've got 15. Um, we got something wrong there, didn't we? But the thing is, we've got places to put them. They are all undercover. They're all safely stowed away, but they're in what you might call temporary accommodation. They're in places with leases of only three or five years. Five years with only three to run net, or just signed a new deal for three years here. So, and what we need is a home for these buses. And what we're looking for all this time is somewhere that they can, where we can have some sort of freehold um, ownership so that we can actually uh, ensure the long-term future of the fleet. So that's what we spend our time dreaming about uh, when we're not wondering about how to fix the engine in 708, which we are at the moment, but that's another matter. So uh, that's our big challenge. You will know that property prices in Hampshire are amongst the highest in the country, although perhaps they're a bit cheaper now. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, but we constantly look. The problem we have is there's just nowhere that is, ever comes up that is remotely possible. We could, I'm sure, raise quite a lot of money if we put our minds to it if we had a proper place to do it for, but we've never found a place yet. So if you know of a place, on a postcard please afterwards, and that's not really out of date now, isn't it? Send me a text or what is it? No, 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 a WhatsApp. Or, as my German friends call it, WhatsApp, yeah? Um, but, uh, or whatever it is. Anyway, uh, um, there's a thought. So ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, a canter through the history, the reason that we're here at all, which is the King Alfred Motor Services, um, of happy memory and the Friends of King Alfred buses who are doing their best to keep the old things alive and I think considering all haven't done so badly so far but it all depends on can we find them a home long term so thank you very much indeed now I'm just going to uh, uh, call upon Richard Chisnell I think we should first of all give James an, an enormous round of applause for what he's doing You are a consummate professional in, in everything you do, James, in running a charity 
with all these wonderful members in, in speaking, in delivering, in driving buses. And um, we are all very fortunate to have you as, as our leader. And you've been leader ever since I met you on the forecourt of this garage just up there in 1973. And um, I, th I think I said it's probably a good idea if somebody wrote a bit of history. <laughs> anyway, good Your evening. Your fault. Good evening. <laughs> good evening, lovely people. You are heroes. This is not about the Chisholm family. This is about the Friends of King Alfred Buses, which has now been going almost, but I think 37, 38 years. Um, and almost as long as grandfather's business. Sadly, I was four when he died, and so I don't remember too much. I do remember trying to dig out buses in, in Crawley and, and um, Sparshot in the snow, in the cold winters. I remember starting buses and many a Christmas morning uh, because my father refused to put antifreeze in the engine for the one day of the year they didn't run, <laughs> because during the year the engine would stay warm, of course, overnight, whatever the weather. And lots of many happy memories. The rotting horse boxes in the quick fit place down below, and all the um, buses up to Chesil Station Yard. I remember lovely people. I remember Bill Arles teaching me my PSV when I came back from South Africa with my lovely wife in 1970. I almost took the corner of the Chesil restaurant off. <laughs> <laughs> but luckily I heard him shouting. I, I, my hearing was better in those days. <laughs> uh, wonderful memories. I remember the pretty unpleasant gents, I think, can I use the word pissoir? <laughs> <laughs> in the corner, does, does anyone else remember? In the corner of this garage down here. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, lots of happy memories, some of which have been stimulated and will be for years to come. But you are all heroes. I represent the family and I'm privileged and proud to do so. Uh, cousin Robert, who's a bit older than me, is obviously struggling with his health. He's 85? Yes. 85, so, um, and he's not, you know, he's, he's not the, the, the oldest by any means, Mary and others. Fantastic. And um, my, uh, his sister Delia would like to come, but she's away this week. Um, sadly, we, we lost John Hillier um, and uh, his sister Anne, because their mother, Evie, used to sell tickets for the, for the, when they'd come down to the many pubs in Winchester to fill their bellies. And um, she used to sell tickets on the way back uh, where they, when they got their SPOs. Anyway, uh, I think this is a, a this, this is a TV series here in the making. <laughs> I've just been reminded of all those, the um, the clapped out vehicles that you found all over the world. I mean, it's amazing. I can't think of anyone else in the country that would have, that would have achieved that sort of mission, that project, and you deserve enormous congratulations. And I would like to think it shouldn't be too difficult to find some sort of crowdfunding or funding process which enables Winchester to be the proud owner of a museum of transport. I know there used to be one at Chilcombe, and that all went to Milestone. In fact, Chesil Station's recurated <laughs> at Milestone in Basingstoke. But let's get some of that back and have Winchester on the map for that reason. Um, but anyway, James, well done. You, do, you deserve recognition far beyond what the family can offer you. I just wish we had a magic wand and we could write a check for the whatever you think it might cost, two or three million probably. And the rest. And the rest. <laughs> you think it might be 20 million? <laughs> it could be. But you do, do carry on with the enormous work that you've done over the years and what you've achieved. Seeing some of those rebuilding projects is quite phenomenal. And I think the world, and certainly the UK population, ought to hear about it more. And um, I know we've read a few things in bus journals and so on, but there's, there's a story here which really is, is to be told. And it's not so much about what the grandfather did with the Chisnell family. Uh, it's what the Friends of King Alfred, under your leadership and your wonderful trustees and other 
fellow members. Um, well done. Thank you very much, and long may it continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. That's, uh, that's very nice. Uh, um, now, we are shortly going to go next door, where there is a buffet available, which I hope you will take advantage of. Um, and uh, as I say, it's just an opportunity tonight, really, for us to um, uh, say thank you to everybody, uh, as well as celebrating this uh, great 100-year anniversary. Remember, incidentally, 10 o'clock Sunday, Broadway, that's when we start taking uh, the three buses, the Dennis, the Albion, and 104, the Tiger Cub, across the four routes that were the initial um, uh, routes. And if you want to know what they are, they are in the program here on the, on the right-hand page. Just before we do go next door, thank you to Richard, thank you to all of you. If there's anything that anyone would like to uh, say, like, I know where there's a place that is just right for about 15 buses, um, quite close to the Broadway, uh, and, and by the way, it's and by the way, it's free. Uh, um, then uh, perhaps it, this is your moment. A lot of people have come a long way tonight to be here. We very much appreciate that. It's a quite an exciting moment, isn't it? A hundred years since the first bus ran, and that's why we're here. Next year will be 50 years since the last day, since that 1973 day. Think of that, 28th of April. So, and if you like riding our buses, 1st of January, they'll be out, and 1st of May will be our big running day. So, um, plenty to keep us amused. So, thank you very much, that's it. James, oh. thank you to you for putting on this evening and oh. talking to us. And, uh, thank you, Bob. Thank, thank you, Bob, <laughs> yeah. Right.